Welcome boys and girls to a big episode on the Carnage House. We're going to be talking all things Venezuela, what happened and how do we fix it. I've got with me to my right, Joel Jamal. How are you going sir? Pleasure to be here. And uh, we've got the resident Venezuela expert, Daniel. How are you going brother? I'm going well, thanks so much. Uh, now Daniel, you lived in Venezuela and we're keen to get your insights um, because you're also quite a politically active person. but. To give a little introduction to Venezuela, uh, 30 to 40 years ago, Venezuela was the richest country in Latin America on a per capita GDP basis. Uh, it was also a net exporter of food. It has larger oil reserves than Saudi Arabia. But today we find Venezuela in a position where the average Venezuelan in 2017 lost over 11 kilos. There are weeks this year where the whole Venezuela, uh, Venezuelan country has had no electricity. Uh, there are no more pets or zoos left in Venezuela because all those animals uh, have been eaten. Uh, inflation is sometimes over a million percent. Uh, and we're gonna find out uh, what led to it and where does Venezuela go from here. So what I wanna do right now is hand it over to Daniel who we brought in to explain this all to us. Um, and he's going to tell us what happened and maybe a bit about his experience uh, growing up in Venezuela. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you for inviting me. Now, uh, I, as you said, I lived in Venezuela most of my life. I am originally from there. Uh, and I came to Australia on a rather rush um, scenarios in 2010. And since then, I have been here. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much of an expert I am, but however, since I have been politically involved and active, both in my homeland as well as here for over 10, 12 years. I might be able to give you some insight. Um, so there's a lot of misconception and uh, not necessarily misinformation, but rather conflicting information as to what happened in my country, how did it land there, and exactly what is to blame to it. Depending on who you are on the spectrum, uh, politically speaking, uh, it could be from the CIA just meddling in the government to this is just what happens when you try socialism to somewhere in between, none of them at all, or all of them together. Um, and to an extent, there's, all of these scenarios have some sort of truth. Um, however, I have felt, and a lot of my uh, people have felt, that it's not really doing a service to understand what's happening in Venezuela if you do not understand the culture and the reasons of, as to why we landed there. So in order to sort of comprehend this, we have to take a step back at to about uh, 20, 40 years, when, as you mentioned, Venezuela was at, at its peak, uh, economically speaking. We are having um, reference to the 1980s, 1970s, where Venezuela not only was the um, the highest growth in economy in the whole of Latin America. It was competing with the tiger economies of the time in Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, in regards to its growth. Um, we also had, as you mentioned uh, correctly, net export in food. And one of our biggest exports was also uh, crude oil, uh, in which uh, our country has over 20% of the world reserves alone. And um, so definitely that created a big boom at the time, economically speaking, However, when this sort of started happening, it wasn't uh, entirely societally uh, growing as it should have. At this period of time in Venezuela, we were under a um, very conservative uh, dictatorship, um, under the self-appointed ruler of the country, um, Perez Jiménez. Uh, he ruled not only with an iron fist, uh, imposing martial law whenever he felt like it, uh, but also there was a considerable amount of corruption in between the governments. In fact, uh, unfortunately, corruption is a taint, uh, fixture of not only my country, but a lot of Latin American countries because of the history of what we have led. And another important thing to recognize and understand is that Venezuela had been going back and forth between progressive, relatively progressive to uh, considerably conservative uh, leaders since around 1900. We had been throughout a 60 period, 60 year period uh, through two different dictatorships uh, that had to be overthrown with a military coup. Um, and this was not different. Uh, but there were always just two parties. It was AD and Copé. It was it. 
so it was either choosing between one and the other. As you have seen in the rest of the world, um, if you try this for enough times, um, the public, the people grow discontent with it and start trying to find uh, different approaches. It doesn't necessarily have to be a good one, it's just a different one. And this is where Chavez came into place. Chavez, uh, around the 1990s, uh, was a low general of the army, uh, also studied politics in one of the most prominent uh, universities in Venezuela, so by no means he's an um, ignorant person. By contrary to it, uh, by far he's one of the most um, strategic and charismatic leaders that Venezuela has had in a very long time. With a lot of flaws, and trust me, I don't particularly like the guy, however, credit credits you. Um, he and a very short group of uh, military, uh, military uh, organizers who were discontent with the government at the time, in, around 1995, uh, tried to stage a coup uh, in the capital. Obviously failed, Chavez went into prison, but, and this is where the cultures are coming into place and you start trying to understand, well, why did we choose this person? Because we're coming from a country that was essentially liberated by a strongman, uh, our, um, back when we gained our independence, it was Simon Bolivar, who not only uh, freed us from uh, the grip that Spain had in Venezuela, but also Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador. And he also worked very closely to uh, aid in the independence of Panama, Mexico, uh, Argentina, and Chile. So definitely that um, characteristic of that perception of what a leader should be, it's deeply ingrained in what we connect to. And Chavez at the time showed some of those scenarios. Um, after he was uh, out of prison in 1998, he ran for presidency uh, on, a on a platform of populism, on a platform of not being that person that was either from one party or another, but rather another side. Um, he ran on a promise to crack down on corruption, he ran on a promise to bring back the glory days of Venezuela. And I don't know if you noticed, there's some similarities to a number of um, leaders in, uh, in the world at this moment. So obviously the rest of Venezuela is seen around the world, the rise of these popular leaders, being on the left or the right, that's irrelevant. It's something that worries us. Um, but at the start, Chavez wasn't all bad. My family never voted for him. I was definitely young enough to not even notice what was happening. But he wasn't a particularly bad leader, where he had the fortune and the, uh, the adequate time in uh, the global economy that not only Venezuela had very strong ties with the United States, and the United States had decided to stage another war because the United States. Uh, so they required a lot of oil, which we um, obviously provided, that increased our economy significantly, uh, becoming a very prominent um, economy in the early 2000s. He was extremely popular uh, to the point where he started seeing in the early 2000s, 2001, that his popularity stopped being connected to his capacity to govern and just his sheer charisma. And that's when things started becoming uh, a bit array. There were obviously obvious people in the opposition disagreeing with his policies, his, his view for whatever reason. And in 2001, well, in 2000, with the um, price of oil considerably dropping from about $160 a barrel to our, just under $100, at this point in time, our economy was 98% based on the price of the oil. That was our main export. And with that, the country started going into, obviously, a recession. This sparked uh, protests and unrest because people were struggling and this is where things started becoming uh, problematic and that's what changed to what we see right now. In 2001, there was an attempted coup at the president. He was uh, successfully evicted for about a day um, and a lot of protests happened in the country. There was hope for change or for whatever reason or anger for these uh, going back to this uh, cycle. And that's when my story starts because that's the first time in my personal history that I start, I recognize or remember 
political involvement and unrest. I was in that, I was, it was 2001, so I must have been like, what, age seven? My family, however, was. My father and my mother were in that protest in the streets because they never agreed with the policies of Chavez and they were exercising their free right to express that. Um, with the coup and the government um, of the time being stepped down for a little time, the government's reaction, that's the first time that it showed its true face. That was the first time in our recent history that we had seen the military going against our people, uh, shooting us with tear gas, with rubber bullets, uh, dispersing as if us arrived. Not only that, in the um, now infamous Yaguno incident, there was a shooter that was uh, in favor of the government that was overthrown, uh, in favor of Chavez that not only opened fire towards the people and my family among them, because my mother and father was, were there when the shooting started, but also that person was protected by the police and later became a member of government. That's when things started changing and that's when things happened. And in my personal experience, I remember two to three years ago when my father came about to tell me what had happened, because I didn't see them that day, I only saw them after, is that they were near the Yaguna Bridge when the incident started occurring, when this person started opening fire on the peaceful protesters, the police protected him and started throwing tear gas. My mother had an allergic reaction to the tear gas and went into an asthma attack. Uh, my father tried to rush her, but obviously with everyone running, it was a very difficult situation. And in my father's words, um, it was essentially almost it for my mother. Were enough for the fact that there was a group within the protesters that was peaceful up until that point in time because they knew they had some inclination or they were aware of that being a possibility and they were prepared. That it was a public, um, back then, was an actual political party and groups from the political party from the far left called Red Flag, Bandera Roja. They were prepared and they knew that that was a possibility and as soon as that happened and legit later when I had the privilege of first seeing them in action, I have never seen in my life someone so prepared to face that level of brutality. There were people that they were in a line together as soon as the protest started, they dispersed, they had um, masks to protect themselves from the tea gas, they had buckets full of urine that apparently turns off the tear gas immediately, something that no one knew. They had asthma medication for people to take there, they had uh, motorcycles around to rush people to hospitals right away, they were the people that saved my mother. That's essentially my connection to the militant left of, the, of Venezuela. But since then, Chavez got into power pretty much straight away. And that's when it started becoming, from, uh, going from that being a sporadic incident once in a lifetime to become a staple of the government. And as Chavez became more paranoid, he also became somehow more charismatic to his people that turned from being a populist leader to almost a fanatic leader, akin to the perception and the love that the Nazis had for Hitler. And I'm not trying to make that connection on the basis of comparing those two groups, no, by no means. It's more of that um, devotion to a leader that it changes from just being you are a good leader too, I will follow you everywhere. And uh, with that, he, this obviously power eventually corrupts, and that amount of power corrupts absolutely. More corruption, more uh, violations, and whilst he tried to continuously pursue his progressive agenda, uh, and he was rather efficient at it in the face of it, people adored him, his uh, popularity came up, his policies economically wise, were only tied to oil. And as the economy of oil started waning, 
um, he started making more and more enemies around the world. And that's when we started seeing the roots as to what you quoted becoming. That is honestly the very like very short version of, of the steps and the circumstances that occurred that only makes sense in a culture because it's connected to a culture that led to him becoming an actor. Mm. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that was a uh, fantastic little overview that you gave us. Um, and I think it was cool, interesting to hear some you. of your personal stories as well. Um, so would you lay, uh, let's call it the blame or the responsibility or uh, for, for, for the place Venezuela finds itself in now, at, at the hands of like um, corruption within the government, would you, um, because if we talk about like Venezuela's um, economic policy for a little bit, now I did a little bit of preliminary research, um, not much, uh, but my understanding is it started with Chavez but continued through to Maduro, um, a kind of nationalising of the oil industry, not even just like the oil fields but all the way down through the supply chain, uh, same thing with food from like the supermarkets to the um, like transport people to the growers, um, which meant that when like the oil prices dropped, for instance, there was no ability to diversify the economy. Um, the government had it in, hadn't it even really invested very much in the oil industry that it was. Um, and a uh, similar thing, I think, with like the electricity thing, which is why we find the blackouts now. Um, so, so what's your reaction to that uh, in terms of the economic policy rather than just like a corrupt, charismatic leader? But also maybe, uh, could you talk a little bit about like Maduro and like what, what his influence has been in, in Venezuela? Yes, definitely. So with the first part of your question, uh, there is honestly, with regards to most of, most of Latin American countries, there is very little separation, if any at all, between the economic policies and the political intent behind it all. Um, as I said, Chavez at the time, between 1998 when he got elected to early 2000s, had implemented policies that objectively, whilst a lot of people disagreed for whatever reasons, were beneficial to the people. Mm. He had decreased poverty, increased literacy rates, uh, gotten a lot of people into the education system because uh, that's what, what his face was. And he worked for a long time because he was under the impression that the money from the old book could come in true. And there's two things that I want to highlight here because um, later on when we start having a discussion exactly as to the benefits or negatives of the economic policies and the political uh, system that they created, um, it's important to note that left and right in Latin America versus left and right in the developed world it's considerably different. And it's, a sh uh, it's something that you don't take, um, that a lot of people tend to not take into consideration when they have a commentary um, discussion about it all. Mm. One, um, Venezuela was the first country in the world that abolished death, uh, death uh, penalty. In fact, as soon as we became independent from Spain, that was part of our constitution, our creation of, the, of our country. Not only that, since mm, at least 1900, uh, our education uh, from all the way to primary school to university has been free. It's paid by the government and supported by the government. Obviously, there is a, a private sector with it, private universities and stuff, but the major universities in Venezuela, the most prominent universities in Venezuela, is University of Simón Bolívar, University, uh, the Central University of Venezuela, uh, the University of Carabobo, those are the best universities in Venezuela, and all of those are public. Um, our um, medical sector is also public. So when you, when you try to connect us to, well, what was he perceived as, because he was a left uh, leader, and Maduro allegedly was, um, when we tr you try to have the conversation like, what is left to, to us versus uh, the rest of the world, that's something that you need to take in mind because if those policies are all in there and that's a lot of policies that uh, the left movement is trying to pursue in places like the United States, UK, Australia even, what is left? Sure. Well, let's maybe talk about it in terms of, um, like, would you say that uh, compared to the economic reform in Chile, 
um, which maybe 20, 30 years ago was the poorest country in Latin America. Um, in terms of per capita GDP, they instituted a bunch of, um, like I think they the Chicago boys under Milton Friedman, like some of that style, like free market style economic yeah. reform. Now Chile would be regarded by a lot of people as the best economy in, in Latin America. Um, I guess my, my question to you is, do you think that there is, that what's happening in Venezuela now um, is caused by poor economic policy? Definitely. But like, a, a linked to socialism. Yes, uh, with that particular part of the end, there is a asterisk to it all, which is the, rea the reality of the world that we live in a globalized economy. Mm. That despite what we, that any country would have a belief, they are not the sole controllers of the impacts that their economic policies have in their country, because whilst they can control to a great extent uh, through fiscal and um, other sort of economic policies, what happens in a bubble, mm. they are intrinsically connected to the rest of the world. Mm. So there's something to be had, and there's an important point to be had with regards as to why the socialist policies that he tried to, work, uh, to implement didn't work in Venezuela at all. Uh, it's because of the peculiarities of the economy in Venezuela. So to break that down, A, definitely, yes, there were poor economic choices and there were poor economic policies because the perception and the understanding and the assumption that the government had was, well, if we are able to control most of the um, means of production, then we are able to better distribute them amongst the people. And that is a line of thought within um, a branch of the left, most more closely connected to communism than socialism because uh, to a bunch of us, including myself, it feels considerably undemocratic to have that amount of power. Uh, he also attempted to uh, separate that power and create a number of various different bureaucratic levels to prevent that from occurring, but that is when the corruption comes into play and essentially makes the whole system rather redundant than actually doing its implementation. But the most important part here, and this is, um, I think the most, the, the point that I want to make the most clear with regards to economic policies and why they didn't work in Venezuela, it's connected to the keys of power. Venezuela is a, and was when Chavez took the power, a developing country. Despite the fact that it was one of the most uh, fast-growing economies, it was still that, a fast-growing mm. economy. I remember when I grew up that I had to stop talking over the phone because my family needed to use the internet and vice versa, and I'm talking about the 2000s. And um, I remember having to use public phones and having to dial up, or having to, things that most of my PSC don't remember, having to dial through a public phone and get the other person to pay for it. Those sort of things, because mm -hmm. that infrastructure that a lot of us assume that is part of the development didn't exist there. Most of the power that came from Venezuela in order to go back, and you can see this in a lot of the developing countries, came from two places. One, who controlled the military, and two, who controlled the major export production. Now, if you see countries that are in already in the developed world that would be considered more progressive, you can think of a lot of the Scandinavian countries. Now, what is their main export? A bunch of it is education. It's individuals, it's skill and mindset. Now, what does that cost? Because that is a managed and the main source of revenue, they are forced to invest more and more in the people. The people become more educated, they can make a better decision for the world, and the societal policies that the government might try to implement, for example, Norway, I have family there, they have a parental leave for both parents, and it's a total of, 12, uh, of one year. You can take it whenever you want, however you want, and it's all paid. Mm -hmm. That is considered a, a left policy that to a lot of people in the US is completely foreign. Uh, why can they do that? Why are they able to implement something like that and other countries like Venezuela can't? It's because in order to get an educated um, population, an educated country, to agree with a policy like that, you're going to just implement it. 
you have to discuss with them. You have to get them to agree and get them to understand why is it that is so important and desired for the rest of the world. And they have to morally choose the benefit of it that uh, even if it comes with an economic um, cost. That did, wasn't the case in Venezuela. In fact, far the contrary. Chavez noticed and recognized that he could continuously implement his policies if he kept the people that voted for him poor. He implemented economic policies and educational policies that essentially made it so that people felt that they were more educated. But we now know by the statistics and the amount of research I have done into those policies that they were extremely poorly implemented. And the whole intention was to create that illusion of uh, that progressive intention. Mm. And that is essentially why uh, these sort of policies just don't work in a country like that. Because in our case, what is our main export? Our main export is oil. In order to export oil, you don't need people. You don't need to put money towards the people. You don't need to ensure that they are more educated, that they're well kept, that they're be they have better options and possibilities. You just need to pay, like it happened in Venezuela, just sell those areas of the land mm -hmm. to an international transnational corporation. They come up and take the oil, pay taxes towards the government, or the government just does it itself. And then that money just goes in and back of the government, never reaches the people. Mm -hmm. And that is unfortunately what happened in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about this a little bit more. Um, if we have a look at like <clears throat> China or the Soviet Union, for instance, like um, China had uh, tried collectivized farming in a similar way to Venezuela had, yeah. uh, with kind of similar results, I would say. Like um, China had like a bad, some bad weather seasons. <laughs> I think some drought, whatever, and like lots of people, lots of people died. Definitely right. Um, the free market argument is that, well, if it wasn't controlled by the collective and you're awarded the people who uh, were making the most food, then uh, a natural hierarchy would have developed where, where, whereby more food was produced. Now, like a lot of countries that are in the Soviet bloc, like Eastern Europe, are also like very uh, like natural resource rich countries. Yeah. Like there's a lot of uh, natural resources exports coming out of Russia. Um, uh, and like, and, and other countries around there, and I guess, the question I'm asking you is, do you think those economic policies, which seem to be similar between Venezuela and other like socialist or communist countries, is part of a pattern of uh, socialism or communism uh, going at, like doing a disservice to the people it seeks to lift up? Uh, yes. So ultimately, the outcome, if you just observe at what is the policy, what is the intent, and what outcome created, it is definitely a disservice to the people. A lot of those policies didn't do what they promised or what they tried to achieve. Now, the argument that we put forth is that it is, it is necessary to understand the context where which these policies were tried to implement and the political response that the international community had towards those mm -hmm. that, um, that ultimately caused the result of whether it worked or not. Uh, what do I mean by that? When uh, the, the times that you're speaking about, so back when we had the uh, Soviet Union and back when we had the Mao China, mm. because the comparison between Mao China and current China is a far more uh, different uh, country, despite the fact that both of them consider themselves to be communists. Uh, there's an important point to be had that that was during the Cold War. What does that mean to these countries and the, the capacity of left policy to be occurring? A lot of the underlying assumption of socialism is the perception that whilst it is definitely necessary for an economic system to occur so that individuals can, be, uh, can receive, have and enjoy basic necessities, it is not ultimately what gives quality of life. Uh, other things, uh, community, um, commodity, nationalism, perceptions of the desire of helping order for the necessity of helping order and because they need it, not because you will get something in return. Those are some tenets of socialism that base uh, the whole essence and make it so that if you don't have that, it won't work. 
Now, during the Cold War, there was, and to an extent there still is, a debate that went from objective discussion of what the policies could do or not, like the one that we have it now, to a propaganda hatred between one side and the other, calling essentially names to each other. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah. Because that was the case, especially during the Cold War, where this uh, conversation became extreme to the point where nearly landed in a third war, mm -hmm. um, because of that, a, country, a socialist country, and it's essentially the necessity of it all, uh, the same way that a, a country that focuses their policies on libertarianism, mm -hmm. it's the connection that they have with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It's their economic ties, their allies, the um, trades that they can make between one another. Mm -hmm. China was isolated for a long period of time, especially during this, this uh, piece, and the Soviet Union. Sure, okay, you know well, we can talk about, like, so China, for instance, I mean, the reason why China has so, such, such a big population today, and we think, but wow, it's one country, how's it going, half million people or whatever. But throughout Chinese history, that, um, I mean, there are 56 dialects which, which each get spoken in China, and China actually used to be a whole lot of different countries, and it's often more helpful to think of it in terms of, uh, as almost like a, a, a Europe, right? Yes, I will. Um, and so when, when, Mao was coming up and, and the Communist Party was coming up, they said, we have a billion people. We don't need, we don't need everybody else. And we have all these different sections of China. Yeah. Um, and if we are one country united, that's basically like having a whole lot of Europe to, to, to use. And so the, the isolation thing, I don't know, I think, it's, I, I think that it's potentially true, right? There's definitely like, if, you, if there's a whole lot of countries that don't want to trade with you because they think you're evil, that's going to hurt your economy. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, is it like the number one like driving factor behind the economy? Oh no, there's, I mean, a, there's a number of different things, and I'm not by any means the, one of those conspiracy leftists who mm. definitely think that everything is mm. caused by the CIA mm. and some other reasons. Um, we love a good. We don't like the CIA very much on this channel. Yeah, don't worry. Um, I'll get shouted by some side that I'm a CIA yeah. agent, and the other side that I'm coming. It's, it yeah. will be fun. It's great. Yeah. Well, are you? Just <laughs> it's just a night Tuesday. It's yeah, fun. just to clarify, <laughs> they will never know. Uh, yeah, no, definitely it's not the only aspect of it. However, and in, in China, you're right, that was definitely part of Mao. In fact, his whole, essentially staple of his government was this idea of the one China policy. Mm. We are just one people and we don't need anyone else. And that has been, honestly, part of the identity of China since its inception. Uh, nonetheless, uh, for example, that was not the perception that the, Russian, the Soviet Union had. In fact, their active intent throughout the whole position was expand, not only expanding their spheres of influence, that still remain to this day, but also the, uh, there is a, a line of thought within these, um, these forms of government in the left that the only way that they can thrive and be able to put these policies through is by creating an alternative to the um, dominance of capitalism. Like, the, there's also a line of thought of like, let's overthrow it and destroy it. I'm not necessarily subscribed to it. But I do agree to an extent that if this sense of socialism that they try to implement, that huge uh, communist over, um, control of the government, mm. can only work if there is at least a group of countries in the world that have influence, that have power, that are willing to still recognize you as a, as a nation and are willing to still trade with you and have a mutual uh, agreement. So for example, you can see that uh, the, uh, the new Russian Federation under Putin has changed considerably, but they still to an extent consider themselves to be left communist uh, countries and they still follow a lot of the, and their predecessors' policies. Nonetheless, Russia is considered to be a rather big economy right now because after the collapse of the World War and the, the Cold War and the shift in policies that has happened, their relation with the rest of the world, mainly Europe, mainly U um, the United States, mainly China, has considerably been, uh, increased and gotten better. Mm. With a lot of its kick ups, and by no means it's anyone's but Russia's fault. Uh, 
nonetheless, you can see that those policies that they tried to implement years and years ago, back then, that didn't work, work somehow now because they have that acceptance. Um, and you can see that comparison, for example, with countries that don't have it, like Cuba. Uh, Cuba, it's... Personally, I would rather not have a big discussion about Cuba because it's... Uh, it's very convoluted information that comes from Cuba. A lot of people see Cuba as one of the most... Uh, um, forward-thinking progressing countries, despite all the embargoes and economic sanctions that have been put into place, with its uh, literacy rate over 98%, mm -hmm. with uh, one of the best... Can I pause uh, you there for one second? Of I would like to go a bit deeper on, on the socialism thing in a sec, but the Cuba thing is interesting, because in, in when I was doing, doing that little bit of research, there's a guy who's saying that there's... Um, uh, Venezuela and Cuba have kind of had a special relationship over the past like maybe decade or yeah. two in which uh, Venezuela would often give uh, Cuba some money from like the, the oil that they export and That's in right. return like Cuba would give uh, Venezuela a range of like intellectuals and doctors and stuff and Definitely. the allegation was that the reason why Venezuela hasn't collapsed up to now is because there are some uh, Cuban intellectuals behind uh, kind of closed doors who are, who are making a lot of the big decisions. Yeah, and that's why I, I said that I personally feel very conflicted because I have seen that, I've experienced that. There is, uh, and those allegations are not just allegations, it's reality. A lot of the high commanding military officers, mm. a lot of the high members of the government, a lot of the doctors and militaries uh, are Cuban nationals. Are not just ex Cuban nationals, no, they hold a Cuban passport, they came from Cuba and they work with Cuban's interests, which I don't know about you, but if you suddenly found out that, and in fact, we don't need to make the hypothetical, we have seen it, that we have taken people out of the parliament yeah. just because they hold on a passport. Mm -hmm. So imagine the contrast of that difference. And yes, definitely, Cuba is by no means, a, uh, in my ass in many countries, it's not a particularly good country. It has a lot of problems, it has a lot of issues, especially with regards to freedoms. And I have had many conversations with Cuban nationals that fled the country, telling me horrifying things about it. Mm. Nonetheless, it has a lot of other things, uh, other benefits, other important things that make it so that Cuba and whatever experiment of politics happened there, it's a very interesting com commentary and conversation and dialogue to be had about what happens when a country tries to implement uh, extreme left policies. Mm. Uh, despite the rest of the world vehemently disagreeing with it, mm. uh, like it happened with the United mm. States. Uh, but yeah, going back to Venezuela, definitely that has had an immense impact, and not only Cuba is to thank for that, because uh, we have similar, if not worse, to Venezuela uh, side agreements with countries like China and Russia, whereby I think it was last year that they gave us $1 billion in a bailout, because of the economic sanctions that the U.S. put in the Venezuela, mm. uh, in exchange from a bunch of crude oil, and definitely it was a ripoff. Definitely it was horrifying. Also, the cost from to take the oil from sorry from Venezuela to uh, China was us and ours alone, and we had to take the other route because Panama Channel was close to us because of the Venezuelan the um, U.S. embargo. So. Definitely was a hindrance to Venezuela, but we were in a desperate scenario, and China benefited from it. So, what do you think, Joel? Fascinating. It's so hard to not get in the classical socialism versus capitalism vein, right? because there's so many ideas where it's like you can just feel like you're slipping into it. Mm. Like just like you were talking before about Norway, how it has a lot of similar services to Venezuela, nationalized uh, healthcare, <coughs> education. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it being relied on from the oil, uh, fascinating, yeah. isn't it? Um, also, um, it's it's there's so much to mm. to that conversation you guys were just mm. having. I mean, it, personally, looking at a lot of the commentators in America on the left and the right, there's not many people are making sense on this issue, and I can see why. And we haven't really mentioned it, but the propaganda on both sides is impossible. Yeah. And so when I tell people, when the people ask me what's going on in Venezuela, because they know that I'm relatively politically aware, I just tell them nothing that I know for certain. 
Yeah, because and, and that is unfortunately a reality to us because going back and going a, a big pass into the timeline, going from Chavez and its government, obviously it came it became more and more uh, mm. authoritarian as it progressed. And I personally and a lot of the people in our circles agree with it. There is a different and very uh, distinct separation between what we believe should be socialism and what things like communism are. Mm -hmm. I am vehemently against communism. The reason why is essentially democracy. Mm -hmm. I believe that everyone should have the right uh, to say what they believe and follow that belief. Obviously, and this is something also important to note, it, that's not to say that your actions are without consequences, definitely. Uh, but you should still have the right to think and believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, but with this, with that particular line of thought of a left government that focuses on controlling the means of production, uh, as opposed to what Norway, or if we stop using Norway because everyone uses Norway, uh, we can see um, Finland does this, uh, similar things. Ireland has wonderful policies on that, Iceland as well. Um, and those are all progressive uh, left countries. Um, the difference between those is that they have to go through the hurdles and the delays and the lengthy, tedious process that is democracy. Chavez went the other way because, of, for whatever reason, he became objectively paranoid after the, uh, the coup and his sole purpose was to expand his grip into power to ensure that he could achieve what he wanted and uh, still be in power. <laughs> this obviously made it so that more and more people became oppressed. Mm -hmm. We had to flee. A lot of people died. And that's sort of when my story of understanding became involved. Okay, well, let's talk about. Um, so Chavez finishes up in like 2012, 2013? 2013, yes. And then uh, um, yeah. after that, we get Maduro. Yes. So what do you think, what do you think about Maduro? What do you think have been the, the key points in his, uh, in his leadership? Yes. So just to give you a bit of a background of Maduro, of who he is and how did he become this extremely powerful person within the government. He's a very recent person in that moment. In fact, he has no political ties to anyone outside of just Chavez. He was just his chauffeur. He was originally a uh, bus driver. His chauffeur? Yeah. Uh, he was originally a bus driver, um, worked in Venezuela for a while, and then became the personal chauffeur of Chavez. True that, and you have, yeah, oh, exactly. Well, it's like when you simplify it in a sentence, it's that like your current dictator was a chauffeur yeah. Like we talk a lot about in the West about qualifications. Yes, and that definitely that's something against him. And yeah. I'm not saying by any means that a degree makes you qualify or not. Of course. Uh, and that your life experiences, whatever they might be, make you unable to do that. But this is something very important to note. Because in the same way that when I started talking about Chavez, despite the fact that I vehemently disagree with it, that I blame him for a lot of the policies that went wrong in my country, and I had to flee my country for fear of death, because of him, I think that the, like, I would still give him the credit that he was an amazing tactician, a wonderful uh, politician, and an extremely charismatic leader. Now, all those qualifiers that Chavez had, they are non existent with Maduro. Yeah. Why Maduro was just his second in command, the only reason that he became his second in command is because with the paranoia that Chavez had, and the fact that the rampant corruption made it so that there was essentially a struggle of power, uh, akin to um, if any of you did studies in uh, Germany Nazi, uh, Hitler had this uh, strategy of whatever the hell he thought it was a good idea of giving um, tactics and giving um, tasks to multiple people and then force them to compete and see which one came up with the best solution and then grab that person and the order to be scrapped. Mm. Because of that sort of perception of like, we need to survive in order to stay in power, Chavez did a similar thing with his cabinet and his, the people in command. And the only reason why Maduro stood ahead is because the other person that could have taken his place, which uh, his name is Yustado Cabello, a horrifying individual, extremely corrupt, 
highly uh, searched in the, the whole world. There's a bunch of different uh, arrest warrants of his name mm -hmm. because of connections with um, international crime and narco traffic. Horrifying person. The only reason why he didn't become the president is because, honestly, Chavez didn't trust him. And Maduro was this just person that didn't understand anything, but followed him to the lab. Mm. And adored him almost like an idol. Like, mm. in fact, there is, this is not an uncommon thing to do. People, both within the government and people that still believe in Chavez, would call him, what's it? Galactic leader? Because he passed away? Right. Yeah, like this, this is the level of uh, adoration mm. that Chavez had behind him. And Maduro only became president because he just followed that uh, church of Chavez. Mm -hmm. To the point where he, at some point in time, just uh, after he became elected, he, and this is in national television, he said in a national television um, broadcast that he had been visited by the spirit of Chavez in the form of a bird and told him that he was doing God's work. Mm -hmm. This is Maduro. And obviously, based on the description that I have given you, he has little to no knowledge as to how to run a country. But the only thing that he follows is, well, Chavez did that, so I'll continue to do that. Now, Chavez only could get away with that because he knew what he was doing to an extent and because we had the oil prices. However, after 20 years of not putting money into the infrastructure, after selling a lot of it and after a lot of that money going into corruption, we went from being able to export three, four billion dollars a day to only, as of this year, only being able to export about 1% of our capacity because mm -hmm. just our refineries and our, uh, our refineries are just destroyed and in disrepair and we don't own any more extraction sites because they have been given to international communities. Which mm -hmm. ones? Um, transnational corporations. They all, the, the whole of the delta of the Amazon, which yeah. is where a lot of the oil is found, there's about four or five transnational corporations that have no connections to Venezuela mm. that extract the oil and they sell it back to the, to the yeah. government. I'm curious because often we, we see, you mentioned China bailed them out uh, yeah. and also... Uh, Russia has done it. Yeah. See, so it's fascinating with China because you see this rapid expansionism that they do where they loan inordinate amounts of money to different countries around the world, especially in Africa. Yeah that they know the country won't be able to pay back, but they do it anyway so they can get control of their critical infrastructure. I mean, yes, I, I agree with you mm -hmm. on that. So I it also, US, it also US happens with the IMF. That. I so. think the US has done that as well in Latin yeah. America. Yeah, I, yeah they're well, so there's the whole Operation Condor yeah. that obviously I hope everyone's aware of. Yeah. <laughs> so so then what's the operation? Operation Condor. How do you spell it? Uh, C-O-N-D-O-R. Condor, okay. Yeah, so that was... Look the, it up at home. Definitely, please do. Uh, that is essentially the whole response of the U.S. Yeah. back in the Cold War to the increasing grasp and um, spheres control that the Soviet Union had, whereby they would, and this is heavily reported, uh, the CIA and the FBI conducted operations in various countries that they considered to be a strategic uh, control areas, mm -hmm. where they would uh, fund money to um, Parameter groups like the contrast in Nicaragua. There is an international yeah, court case Nicaragua. on this scenario alone uh, that forced them to say this is illegal. Stop doing it. Uh, they also are responsible for the rise of Pinochet in Chile, mm -hmm. one of the most horrifying dictators in the history of Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, the whole um, government that caused the death of millions and millions of people that believe in progressive values in Argentina that is known as the age of the, the um, mist uh, in Spanish is desaparecidos. Yeah. That all happened because of Operation Condor. That was a government-led uh, government um, operation by the CIA and FBI to topple governments that were closer to the left and change them to um, right-wing governments that would be amenable to whatever the US wanted. Mm -hmm. So definitely that all happened, mm -hmm. and I'm not, look, obviously it's there. Uh, and that also causes the fact that a lot of people in Latin America, and obviously the rest of the world, are just extremely distrusting of the US. 
with good reason. Yeah. And therefore, in their desperation, seek help of rather not trustworthy people like the Chinese government. So this is a fascinating idea, isn't it? Because on one side you've got uh, often America expansionism, imperialism, I guess you could call it, being seen as very aggressive and often associated with right wing, maybe even Nazism. Yeah. But it's fascinating because I'm finding myself in furious agreement with you, and I do identify as a conservative, where when I when I see that sort of overreach from uh, transnational corporations yeah. like that, that's not what we want at all. We want a lot of our well, of course, our vital industry, yeah. our services, our health places to be pri um, like nationally owned or Australian owned. Yeah. And whether that's Australian businesses, private businesses, that's fine. Australian owned, and we see that with a lot of companies like Qantas, they have they have quotas. I think they're fifty one percent. Yeah. Uh, has to be Australian owned. See, from the conservative side or the right side, we find a situation where often we're called Nazis and being nationalistic and you shouldn't be pr proud of that, there shouldn't be limits on that. But we don't see any problems with yeah, no, and, and that. Honestly, it makes full sense. And I think that with the political climate that we see right now, there has been a slow progression of losing the understanding of what left and right means mm. in the current political climate. Because, and I don't know how many people are actually aware of this, the spectrum of, um, of political policies and ideologies and beliefs is not just left and right. It's an actual axis. There is left, right, libertarian and totalitarian. There is such a thing as a totalitarian right-wing government, like the Nazis. And that's why a lot of conservatives uh, are the, like, that are being attacked by a misguided um, audience yeah. are called Nazis yeah. because the Nazis represent that extreme right-wing totalitarian government. Yeah. Mussolini was another example in Italy. Pinochet was another example. That is not to say that if you go to the opposite side of the left, you will find the solution. There is a such a thing as communism, which is a totalitarian progressive government. We, like, we don't, Putin is kind of in between there, but if you want to have big names, we have Mao, who is responsible for about three times as much death. 65 million. As, um, yeah, 65 million people died under Mao because of his policies, and that is, uh, yeah, about three times as much as what Hitler did, 23 million in the Holocaust. Uh, Stalin was another prominent example. Castro in Cuba is another prominent example of a totalitarian left regime. What the socialism that I believe in uh, pursues is, yes, progressive policies, but staple in liberties, staple in the equality of everyone, in the fairness to everyone to have the right to speak, and in democracy. And that ties into democratic socialism. The Precise. democratic sort of, I guess you could say, watering down the communist uh, attributes of socialism. Precisely. And, and that is, to an extent, the purest form of socialism yeah. because uh, Marx and the Communist Manifesto yeah. essentially preached that. It yeah. was Lenin that tried to continue that, and when he was killed by Stalin, what we know of communism was a Stalin's version of what the Communist Manifesto was. Mm. Didn't Lenin still have the gulags? Not to the far-reaching extent that they that um, yeah. that Stalin had, well, and the gulags with Lenin were, and I don't agree with this, but it made sense at the time. The gulags were only used uh, with the extreme um, elite bureaucrats that were still connected to the Tsar in Russia, that essentially led to the destruction of Russia in World War One with the, uh, the regime. Well, let me ask you um, this question: If you have um, well, I want to finish up Venezuela before we of do course, some uh, before we do some uh, politics. Very um, nice <laughs> so this guy, so Venezuela's got two people who who think they're the president uh, right now. <laughs> now you've got um, Maduro, who's yeah. and, and it, it's quite interesting um, because they are recognised kind of on geopolitical lines by different countries, right? Mm -hmm. So the people who recognise Maduro are like your Cuba, Russia, China. 
um, and I think a few others as. Um, There's about three other uh, names there. There is um, Bolivia, there is North Korea, go mm -hmm. figure, uh, and Iran. Yeah. yeah, I think that, and Turkey, and those are the prominent countries. Yeah. And then you get, uh, I think, and then this Yuan Guaido. Juan Guaido, yes. Juan Guaido. Which, who's recognized as the leader of Venezuela by over 50 countries around the world. Yeah, that's including like US, Western Europe. Um, Most of Europe, by the way. Etc. Yeah. Now, so, but, but this uh, Guaido, he calls himself a, um, uh, he, he also calls himself a socialist, but I think uh, he, what he's saying is that he thinks the election that he uh, officially lost, but he thinks it's rigged. Um, I think a lot of people in Venezuela think it was rigged for Maduro. Uh, he, he's arguing on a platform of free elections. I haven't seen, when I, had, when I looked him up, I didn't see that he was offering uh, a lot of new economic policies. He was arguing for free elections, but I'm happy. why don't you tell us what you think about um, yeah, of course. The, now, the situation. Yeah, definitely. Now, this is... I, I, I honestly comprehend and understand why um, international commentators are having such a hard time trying to understand whatever the hell is happening in Venezuela right now, because mm. most of us have a really hard time understanding what's happening in Venezuela right now. Having said that, fortunately, part of my background is in law and uh, foreign policy and application and human rights. So I have a comprehension and understanding of where he came to be. Now, I'm going to make this point very clear before the comments tell me otherwise. Uh, they will add away, but I just need to make it clear. <laughs> Juan Guaido is not a elected president. Juan Guaido is not seeking to become an elected president. Juan Guaido did not try to make a coup against uh, Maduro, nor is he trying to become the president of Venezuela. None of that is correct. To give you an understanding of how this mess came to be, I need to give you a brief insight of the laws that make it to ha made it happen in Venezuela, as well as to what is it that happened. Back in 2014-15, um, Maduro was already in power, making horrifying things, uh, very poor economic choices. That's when the inflation became from being extremely high to what we now know was hyperinflation, higher rates than Germany had before Hitler came into power. Uh, just to give you anecdotes so that you can comprehend the numbers, because honestly, just giving you numbers doesn't do justice. Mm. I remember people, my friends in Venezuela, my family in Venezuela, going to the markets, like the Sunday markets that you go here, to buy groceries and buying bananas or like apples or things like that with a stack of uh, bills. And this stack was not counted by the people, uh, and the vendors, they were weighed because the value of the currency was so worthless that it was just easier to weight it and make it from there than it was to count it. That is the level of ridiculousness that occurred under the horrifying and stupid policies of Maduro. Because objectively, they make no sense. He just decided to deal with inflation, he would just erase zeros from the, mm -hmm. uh, from the currency, and that will be done. We know for a fact, and has been, have known for over 100 years, but that just doesn't work. Uh, nonetheless, he went ahead with it. And he just continuously threw the military, uh, the military towards the people. The death, that, the death that occurred by police brutality on the Maduro for, like, as long as he had been in power, happened more than what Chavez had around the whole, his whole regime. And, and Maduro has been in power for, like, half the time. Anyway, so this is sort of the understanding of what dire situation we were struggling with. In 2015, uh, December of 2015, there was the parliamentary elections of the General Assembly, which is our equivalent to the Parliament. That was the first election since Chavez had been into power that was won by an absolute landslide by the opposition. And by opposition, I mean, and this is another thing that, I, that makes no sense to anyone that is not in Latin America, there is only one opposition party. Now, this party is called MUD, M -U -D, which is the Table of Unity. 
joined by every other political party across the spectrum from militant left, which is the, the closest to the, the, the only militant left in the party that exists right now, because when Red Flag, my party, uh, the one that I mentioned before, got disbanded, our members were chased out of the country and or killed, and why I'm here. Um, and that was the party that also got elected Chavez, sometimes. Um, the, the, only, the only other party that is that far left and militant is Radical Cause. They are part of the Table of Unity, as well as con um, parties like First Justice, which is a right-wing, like, conservative party. And, like, they're not far right-wing, right they're just conservative, they believe in democracy, they believe in the free market. Like, we all stand as one party and we all get together mm. and choose who's going to go for each party. Why do we do that? Because we have reached that position of we are so desperate that all we seek is the things that we're always preaching. Mm. The whole platform that we have together is free elections to a peaceful resolution mm. and the installation of a new government elected by the people. So, you, so you transcend the x-axis of left yes. and right. You guys completely you form this grand coalition. Yeah, it's, a, it's called voice. table of unity. And we disagree with each other all the time. Yeah. Nonetheless, we all stand together as one party when it comes to the presidential elections and when it comes to the, um, okay. the assembly mm -hmm. and the parliament, we all stand together as a coalition. Yeah. We, like, they all represent different parties and Guaido, for example, he is part of uh, a left party called Popular Will. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, he is also, he was elected in that as being another parliamentarian. That was in 2016. In 2015. In 2016, at the beginning of the year, the parliament was supposed to become into power and be elected. However, because uh, Maduro lost so much power within the parliament to the point where we had absolute majority, yeah. and what that gave us was the capacity to uh, essentially revoke the president uh, if uh, under the, ex the explicit reason of being undemocratic and fight, um, destroying their people <coughs> and elect a new one. Yeah. That was the power that we had back in 2016. Mm -hmm. However, two things happened. One is that there were some um, criminal prosecutions to two parliamentarians. Um, to, my, to the understanding of everyone involved, there were bogus um, criminal investigations mm -hmm. because the higher command of the policy, the, the, um, the police is controlled by the, the party. Mm -hmm. But those two parliamentarians not being able to be elected made it so that we just were under the threshold of the absolute majority. And um, Maduro declared a state of emergency. A state of emergency that made it so, yeah. Happy uh, baby. Yeah, convenient. Um, we have seen that again around the world. It's very interesting. Uh. <laughs> um, he declared a state of emergency saying that the assembly was going against yeah. the party, going against the government, going against the people and destroying them, yeah. and disbanded. Mm. First, the whole Supreme Court, what we call the, um, the High Tribunal of Justice, disbanded the whole thing and elected 30 new, uh, 13 new justices that were all part of the party and all connected to him. And this um, new um, Supreme Court effectively gave him the necessary auxiliary powers needed for him to create what it's now called as a constituent assembly, which is essentially a new parliament elected with all members of his party, including his wife and his son, as the heads of the parliament. I sound like the best people for the job. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> It was this uh, assembly that called for the uh, presidential elections 2016. Mm. It was this assembly that got our biggest opposition leader, um, um, Leopoldo Lopez, uh, thrown into jail based on the fact that we went out in protest against started right, rise around the world and uh, around Venezuela, and the government went and killed a bunch of people, and he was personally convicted for the death of every one of them. A hundred people died at the hands of police brutality and 
Leopoldo Lopez, because he was the face of the opposition at the time, he was thrown into jail and prevented from running in that election. Everyone that was also prominent, um, Enrique Capri Capriles, Maria Corina Machado, they were all banned from running in that election. Mm -hmm. The election was called three months earlier, and even by the accounts of the company, the private company that provided the electronic machines for voting to the government, they said that those machines were tampered with and they personally did not recognize the results because they were bogus. Wow. That was the election of 2016. Interestingly enough, about like 60% of the opposition just boycotted the whole election. They were like, this is illegal elections. They don't exist. They, like, we're not going to participate. And apparently uh, Maduro still got the same amount of votes that Chavez had at his height of uh, popularity. So coffee. Now, this is where White House that comes into play. Because those elections were so irregular and so unconstitutional, the Assembly, in 2000, uh, at the beginning of this year, under the rule of uh, Guaido, because essentially the way that it works is that the head of the Assembly gets um, passed down every three months or so to each party so that they all have the, um, the capacity to be the, um, the president of the assembly. When popular will, which is, by the way, the party of the Polo Lopez, the, the leader that I, I, was, I said that was thrown into prison, got the presidency, Guaido was the one that took that role. And Guaido, alongside a, a number of intellectuals from around the world, including people from the United States, We've seen um, various uh, political leaders of the sides. I personally don't feel comfortable giving credit to Mike Pence. He has done a lot of things, but he only came to the picture where things could resolve. Uh, however, despite the fact that I don't agree with a lot of his policies, I have to give credit to Marco Rubio. Because Marco Rubio, being the, represent the um, Republican leader that represents most of the Latin American communities, has been the uh, best ally and the biggest uh, outspoken for Venezuelan issues since 2015. Mm -hmm. Making sure that our people are protected, making sure that the rest of the world is aware of the sheer amounts of humanitarian crises. Like they, the High Commissioner for Refugees around the world currently has five humanitarian crises that are confirmed by the High Commissioner. One of those is uh, uh, Rohingya. The Rohingya genocide that happened in 2018. The other one is Nicaragua and uh, Salvador, which is the cons the conversation we have had uh, with the U.S. of the biggest big caravans of people fleeing the the country. The the next one is Sudan. Uh, I hope people are aware of what's happening mm -hmm. in Sudan. We did the Sudan podcast last week. Yeah, there you go. Another one is Venezuela. That is the level of the sheer amount. Yes. He, when he got into power, he effectively called an article of our constitution that makes it so that if there is no president, if we haven't called elections and we have no leader, the assembly president has becomes automatically the interim president of the, of the country and their sole purpose is to make sure that democratic processes are followed right. so that we can elect a new president. Mm -hmm. That is what Guaido teach. That is what the current challenges happened because they said, according to the, they essentially legitimized the government that was in power, which is Maduro's, and said, we are gonna call new elections, mm -hmm. but we cannot call it until we, A, make sure that the military doesn't just revoke it because so far the Maduro regime still controls the military and that's why we have seen so many people die mm -hmm. over the last six, seven months. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as ensuring that the process is free, democratic, yeah. and equally representative because all the powers, so the judiciary, the executive, legislative, electoral, and popular council, those are the five powers in Minnesota, all of them are pushed over the line. Mm. So that's essentially the problem here. And the rest of the world is essentially recognizing this, about 55 countries around the world, uh, recognizing Guaido as the legitimate interim president, and they're trying to make sure that while without intervening, making sure that 
this transition of power goes uh, as smooth as possible. Can I push back just a bit, if you don't mind, Dougal? You mentioned um, the US. Yes. And how a lot of a lot of the US um, government, in Trump's government, that yeah. he's selected, they're actually advising Juan Guaido on how, as interim president, on how to proceed forward in the most democratic way, uh, and advise him on various matters in the country. Yes. Again, you're a democratic socialist. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Some two of the leaders you would see emblematic in America, because we're talking about America, yeah. were emblematic of. Democratic Socialism is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, also known as AOC, yep. and Bernie Sanders. Yes. Now, um, they don't agree with you on a lot of what's going on in Venezuela. Yeah. You're wearing a Labour shirt. Yeah. I'm, I consider myself a conservative. Now, I'm making points for AOC and Bernie Sanders for a second, just so we're intellectually honest. They've been fairly silent on Venezuela. Yeah. And this must be really tough for you because it's not only a topic which is closely linked to your identity, yeah. but it's also, um, it affects your family. Um, and these are two leaders that you perhaps look up to in your ideology. Yeah. So how do you reconcile the two? Um, because a lot of people on the left, even democratic socialists in America, they make the point that America's um, sanctions, you know, uh, you know, they, they, they've got an inv a vested interest in Venezuela, whether yeah. that's the oil or whatever. How do you rationalize the two? Because I, I, I don't understand where to go. Yeah. It just seems inconsistent. Look, um, the short answer is with difficulty. It is something that, in fact, took me a long time to grasp and comprehend. Because, uh, and Joel, do you know this word for the audience? And um, this all occurred and this all happened as the state elections in New Wales occurred, elections that I was personally actively campaigning for, a multitude of left um, candidates, and then the federal election that I was also heavily involved. Um, so it was me having to come to terms and try to make sense of why is it that I am consistently fighting for these values that I wholeheartedly believe uh, on and making sure that this uh, style and form of ideologies and governments get um, become part of Australia and then realizing that well those same policies misguided as they were at the time and their poor implementation those same policies are the justification of death of my people ultimately after months and months of mm -hmm poor copy mechanisms are trying to just make my sense around it all. The way that I see it now is essentially both of those sides have important points that need to be amended and need to be recognized because this is a very, very delicate scenario. Mm. The US and they have made absolutely no effort to change this narrative because that is a narrative that including President Trump have said they will not rule out military intervention in Venezuela. In fact, there are a number of uh, prominent uh, individuals in this movement, including, I think, is the current governor of Florida, mm -hmm. who actively advocate and try and try to persuade the leaders of the opposition in Venezuela, including Guaido, to approve of a military intervention so the U.S. can come in and um, overthrow Maduro. Now, I mentioned Operation Condor. That is still in the back of our heads because it changed generations of people in Latin America. We still recognize and remember what happened in Libya, what happened in Afghanistan, and what happened in Syria. Half of my people, including half of my family, that have disowned me for everything that I do and the shirt I'm wearing, are uh, actively advocating for the US to intervene and they don't give a shit about any consequences because, and to be fair, it makes sense. They're desperate. They're not eating properly. They're not, they don't have any other options. My father, for example, to give you a, a, just a small anecdote that will make sense of just how desperate people are. 
My father is currently living in um, my grandmother's house with my sister and two of my aunties. My grandmother is a pensioner and she receives pension from a private um, uh, bank that she was a manager of and from my uh, past grandfather who uh, was in the military. So she's definitely would be well off. However, my father, who, despite the fact that he studied and is a nuclear physicist, is just a regular teacher in a school, he's the one that makes most money in the family. The reason why he's the one that makes most money in that whole household is because he does uh, private classes to uh, rich kids, $10 an hour for about four or five hours a week. That is more than the rest of my family in that household, household and a month. So when they tell me that they are desperate and they don't care if the US comes with the Marines and kills people and overthrows the government and puts a new government, even if it's like, if we are annexed to the US like Costa Rica is or Guam is, they don't care because they're that desperate. And the rest of us that sees how wrong that is and how it has happened in the past and all the horrible consequences that came to it, say, yes, definitely, we need the support of the international community. Yes, we do need uh, them to speak up and voice up. But, and that's where I personally land, I will never condemn or accept a military intervention with the US because I'm just tired of having to bury my friends. There are five close friends that I went to high school with that are no longer here because of what I fought for. There are at least 20 to 30 people that I knew at some point in time during my point in organizing a protest that are not here anymore because they were trying to say the same things that I said, but they were made with a bullet. I nearly suffered the same fate were not for a fact that one friend stepped in and took the bullet to elect. So when they, when I see leaders that would represent my values, like Ocasio Cortez, like Bernie Sanders, being silent about the issue or not agreeing, because whilst Ocasio Cortez has been mostly silent, Bernie has come out and said at least that he's opposed to the military intervention. I also understand. I also get that because I am personally terrified. And it's just the reality that it's just two different parts of my identity and who I am that for whatever reason, and the reason being the extreme polarization and the destruction of what it meant to be Venezuelan outside of politics, that these two populist dictators, because there's no other word than dictators, did to my country. The things that I'm experiencing, that separation of identity, it's not just me, it's everyone in Venezuela, because they have family that they grew up with, sisters, brothers, fathers, that just because think differently politically, have completely disowned and erased of their lives. That is the political climate in Venezuela. And one of the key reasons why I still do what I do, why I still wear this labor shirt, why I still go and get shouted that I'm a commie or a CIA agent or whatever the fuck in between, it's because I fear for that fate, especially here in Australia and in places like the US, because I see the same patterns that happened when Chavez went into power. The same things occurring, calling instead of emergencies, um, destroying the political debate from let's have a logical argument as the positive and the negative of your policies to it's just the left or it's just the right. Those were the same things that I saw when I was young. And I would hate to have to feel, let alone experience that again, but also have to see my brothers here in Australia having to experience the same things that I've been lived like that. It's devastating. It is indeed. And to be clear, there's no line you draw where it would be fine for 
any military surrounding Venezuela, not in, including America, would interfere. You, you think it should all be internally resolved uh, with surrounding militaries left out, but advisors are fine. Look, this is, mm, I, I mentioned briefly that my grandfather was in the military. Mm. Um, I remember a conversation that I had with him uh, at some point in time because when I was living in that house and he was still alive, uh, I by mere chance found his gun because he had a home gun in the house. Because of course, and I asked him about it, and he said to me, and he has always talked to me, "You should never, ever own a gun." unless you are absolutely certain that you will have no issue using it. If I accept or give in to the idea of, sure, let's have the military surrounding Venezuela just as a show of force to prevent more, more uh, death, the only way that I would be accept, uh, comfortable with it as a person it would be if I'm also comfortable with it, with them going in and killing my people. And that's something that I'm, not, I'm, I'm tired of seeing the bloodshed. I'm just exhausted of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think that there's uh, a few things I'd love to talk about in another episode, but I think that will wrap us up here. Um, Joel, how did you go? You enjoyed it? Well, I haven't got the tissues out. I think if we go for another 10 minutes, I'm going to be there. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's very touching. And I think that um, a lot of the... One thing I do know from all of this is that when we see the ideologies from the left and the right discussing this around the world, I'm glad this... I hope this video humanizes it a bit more and we see that these are real people's lives. Just like how the filming of the... Um, Vietnam sort of war sort of revolutionized what people were thinking and that was the first time I actually really saw the war um, and people really think about left and right the ideologies and the policies they're putting forward that these are the we've got to think very carefully about how we proceed but um, one th policy which is always encouraged is more free speech no shutting it down because it just boils up and, it, and you get a Venezuela situation. Okay, Daniel, thank you for coming on. Oh, any, any final words to the uh, Carnage House audience? Yeah, look, I agree wholeheartedly uh, with Joe and just, I, I work best with anecdotes. I hope people don't mind. Uh, just to come, like, bring that point home. On election night, in uh, the federal election that just happened, <coughs> I was in some forgotten church somewhere in Banks. If people don't know where that is, that's fine, most people have no idea. It's somewhere south of uh, Sydney. But I was there as a booth captain for Labour, and basically stayed there from 7am to 8pm, scrutineering and everything. And I had a number of various interactions with the booth captains of the Liberal candidate there which won the election. They were a beautiful uh, family of immigrants that had come from a country toned by the same things that I experienced here. And when they were speaking to people and telling them about the policies that the Liberal candidate had, they will always bring up the same points. Make sure that there is a future for our children and they can grow and become better. When I heard that, I realized that ultimately we're not that different. We all want the same thing. The only thing is that we disagree into what path to take. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, honestly, I think that should be spoken about more. That despite the fact that right now we're sitting in and have completely opposite views in a lot of different political things, we all just want the same thing, which is a better country for those who are coming after us. And we shouldn't let the politicians use that as a tool to put us against each other. Okay, fantastic. I think uh, 
think you'll find all three of us in, in furious agreement there. <laughs> um, so Daniel, Joel, if, uh, if people liked you and want to hear more from you, is there a place where they can find you? You can follow me on uh, YouTube, Joel Jamal, it'll be in the link below, and uh, follow me on Facebook, follows only, no friend requests. Yeah, uh, and with me, I do too many things, uh, but yeah, I'll put all my social media things in the description, and definitely if you want to have a chat, anything else, uh, yeah, okay. I always... Leave a comment below, what did you guys think? I'd be pretty keen to do another episode. I think we can do some good stuff on um, a bit more political theory, because I think the Venezuelan issue was just so complicated, we didn't have a lot of time to dive yeah, into it. Yeah. I also think one that I'm pretty, um, what one I'd like to hone in on with the focus on Venezuela is um, guns, uh, citizen ownership of guns, right to bear arms, whether that might have changed. Um, there was a good meme about um, you know, they, they always say citizens should never own a rocket launcher, but then it had the, the image of the Venezuelan truck driving into the crowd of protesters. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But anyway, that, uh, we can save that all for another day. Yeah. And um, appreciate, Daniel, some fantastic points and some fantastic stories as well. I think we're all better off for it. Take it home, consider it, mull it over, see if you uh, wake up tomorrow with any changed opinions. Uh, let us know. Thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.